biological and also uh, biological, well not biological, anyway, anyway, I suck. <laughs> and these guys are awesome and I appreciate it. Um, I was supposed to extend this talk, but now I'm going to have to shrink it a bit, so it's going to be really fast. Um, I think most of you were in here for my talk yesterday. You probably know who I am. If not, you can Google me. Uh, why would you want to script? Uh, this is the agenda. How not to do scripting. We'll talk about some scripting vectors that won't cause your soul to be lost. We'll talk about scripty, the polar, and drools, and then any leftover time, which I doubt we'll have. We'll go to Q&A. That's me. Hi, I'm Jeff. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying. Um, we won't go over my CV right now. Why would you want to do scripting in OpenNMS? There are two basic use cases. One is I'm not a Java developer, but I would like to do something a little bit wacky, and I'd like not to kill my OpenNMS server doing it. And also it's requisite that you be not afraid to write a little bit of JavaScript, Groovy, Python, some sort of scripty language that can run on the JVM. There are others. We'll cover them in a moment. The other big case is I am a Java programmer. I want to do some rapid prototyping. Let's say I want to develop a polar monitor, but I don't feel like building and rebuilding and writing unit tests right now. I just need to get some stuff done, get it done fast, and I'll think about unit tests and source control and that kind of stuff later. So let's talk about how not to do scripting before we delve into how to do it. Um, one way not to do scripting is in the polar via the general purpose monitor. Who's used the GP monitor before? Awesome, good, I'm glad. Um, it's in there, it exists, um, it can save you when you need to do something in a pinch, but you should never, ever, ever use it. That's the answer to the question, when should you use the GP monitor? Never. So it can save the day, but you should not use it. Another way you should not script, if you can avoid it, is doing auto actions on events. Who's used this before? Most people don't know that it exists. Yeah, I know you have. Um, we've actually deprecated the auto action daemon. It's not out yet. We were going to pull it out, and then we learned that at least one customer was using it, so we, we gave it a stay of execution. Um, in addition to ActionD being deprecated in the 1.12 releases, it creates threads in an unbounded manner, which sounds awesome, but can really be bad. It can have really awful implications. We'll talk about why in a minute. Another way you should not script OpenNMS is using NotifD to kick off clever external scripts via binary notification commands. Um, ideas on why not? Well, the tasks are uh, run on a schedule. There's by default a 20 second <coughs> lag, which really isn't that useful for doing anything that requires near real time performance. And also, just like ActionD, NotifD creates task threads f out of an infinite pool. Its pool of threads is not bounded, so you can kill your JVM and your server by overdoing this. Uh, the big reasons not to use these external script execution thingies, fork and exec. You guys know fork and exec? Yep. Mostly your Unix users? Yeah, it's expensive on Unix. Your JVM may be several gigabytes in virtual memory. You're going to fork that. You've probably got an operating system that does copy on write, but it's still expensive even though you're sharing memory. Hmm? You had a comment, Marius? If you took loan, it's not that expensive. Yeah. Um, the other reason is even on operating systems where fork exec is not terribly expensive, Java really sucks in the way that it interacts with the operating system on most platforms. Uh, the runtime.exec method is really kind of dumb. So, it, so it's not direct mapping to fork? It's not a direct mapping to fork, okay, and works. the efficiency of it varies wildly from one platform to another. That's so if you're on Solaris now and you move to Linux, you may lose or win, but it's, yeah. it sucks to use runtime.exec much. It's not built for it. So how should you do it? Ways that will not cost you your mortal soul. Script D. Who's used script D? Good. BSF monitor, anybody used it? I wrote it. Drools, anybody used drools? I like to use drools as awesome part. Yep. OK, so let's dig in to these a little bit. Let's start with script D. Script D integrates the Apache Commons bean scripting framework into OpenNMS. Uh, it's version 2.4 of the bean scripting framework. We also bundle the bean shell jar, if anybody's used bean shell. It is an event-driven component. 
scripts fire instantaneously when the events that they're tied to hit the event bus and are picked up by script D. So there's none of that 20 second lag that note if D implies. Script D also does unbounded thread creation, but it's designed for doing this, so it sucks a little bit less than doing unbounded thread creation from other daemons. And you're not forking an external process in those threads. Supported languages include any language that the Bean scripting framework version 2.4 supports. Um, out of the box, that means Bean shell because we include that jar. Bean shell gives you both strict, i.e. exact Java syntax, and a relaxed syntax where you can just name properties instead of having to say get in the Bean style, hence the name Bean shell. Um, you also get JavaScript out of the box because that is included with the Bean scripting framework via the Rhino library. There are also add-on jars that give you the ability to do Python scripting in script D or any BSF component. That requires the Jython jar to be dropped in. I've done this before. It works. You just have to remember to put it back if you ever transplant the system to another server. Um, you can do tickle via the jackal jar. Say that three times fast. You can do Groovy, which gives you, much like Bean Shell, you can use strict Java syntax in Groovy, or you can use Groovy's sugarier syntax, which is a little bit easier to digest. Yeah? What, you, what would you suggest to use Python or QCL? Or it's this, it's which one do you prefer? Performance-wise, they are. Performance-wise, they both run on the J JVM. Jython is more um, up-to-date in maintenance terms. Okay. So probably I would say, if you don't have a personal preference, Jython okay. over Tickle. And then finally, there's JRuby for, uh, for the kids, because the kids love Ruby. Um, the scripts that run out of script D, I'm sorry? And JavaScript. The kids do love JavaScript too, it's true. The scripts that run from script D may be inlined. You can put them directly into script D configuration.xml. Uh, that sucks. I recommend externalizing them into files and using a director that I'll talk about in a second to pull them in. Okay. Here's a top level on the BSF monitor. Uh, much like ScriptD, it integrates the Bean scripting framework from the Apache Commons project. Unlike ScriptD, it is not a daemon level open NMS component. It's just a polar monitor class. It's just like the ICMP monitor or the HTTP monitor. It works exactly the same as the others. It just happens to run scripting code. Um, like all the polar monitors, it is schedule driven. So whenever a poll is scheduled for a service that uses the BSF monitor, that's when it gets invoked and it reads in. Um, it reads scripts at each invocation. So you can actually change your scripts on the fly and they'll be reread from the file system the next time your service gets pulled, the next time its schedule comes around. And again, just like script D, supported languages, any that the Bean scripting framework supports are supported here. Caveat being you may need to provide your own jar for things like Jython. Talk about drools, and um, I'll just warn you now that I don't actually have any slides that delve into drools. I thought that um, Marcus Schneider's drools talks would probably give you plenty of examples, plus I ran out of time. Um, drools is not a bean scripting framework execution vector, unlike the other two that I've covered here. It is instead a correlation engine, um, sort of expert uh, BI system that is baked in. It's included in OpenNMS, you can use it in 1.10. If you try to use it in previous releases, you will lose because there is a version, a dependency version conflict. So if you're running 1.8, I'm sorry, but you need to upgrade to 1.10 in order to use drools. Um, it does bring all the advantages of drools. So those of you who are familiar with it, you know about all of the magic of the ret tree and, uh, and that fun stuff on the left-hand side of a drools rule. The stuff on the right-hand side is where you can have lots of fun with scripting. That scripting comes in standard Java syntax only, at least in the version of drools that we embed. Later versions may give you other language options. So it's, com it's completely integrated with the drools and drools are completely usable from one to ten. Yes, it's drools expert only. You don't have governor or any of the other drools suite components. It's just drools expert, but you can do a lot of really powerful stuff from it. Drools comes from the JBoss project, and it refers to a suite of, oh, no, 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 no. you know what expert is, you know yeah. what governor is, and so forth. All you get is expert in the context of OpenNMS. 
We'll probably pull in governor and some other components later because it's just so cool. Yeah. But right now, all we have is expert. And again, yeah. Scripty creates a thread each time an event script fires. OK, any other questions before I move in and dive into Scripty somewhat? OK, good. All right. Um, so this, should, this slide should say script D in some depth. Um, we'll have coverage of configuration basics, caveats, working around these caveats, and a really cheesy but actual customer asked me to do this for him example of script D use. Here's the default script D configuration.xml. This is what comes in the box. There's nothing there. All it does is just create a bean shell BSF engine, nothing more. Um, if you want to script in languages other than bean shell, you'll need to declare an engine for the language that you wish to use, be that Jython, JRuby, whatever. This is all that's in the default one. And of course, we can add things to it, and we usually do. There are plenty of examples on the wiki of doing interesting things with script D. In most of those, the scripts themselves are inlined into the script D configuration.xml file. Um, you can have a start script, a stop script, and as many event scripts as you wish. The event scripts can be tied to one or a list of event UEIs. Everybody knows what a UEI is here? Yeah. Good. Um, so you can have them fire for every event if you don't specify any UEIs, or you can specify one or n number of particular UEIs for which the event scripts will be fired. Of course, event script is the interesting one. There is an event to reload the contents of script deconfiguration.xml, but it's not reliable. It doesn't seem to reset its state totally, so I don't recommend using it. I recommend instead do what I recommend in the next slide and just count on restarting OpenNMS if you ever need to change script deconfiguration.xml for any reason. So how can we get around this? Beanshell provides this nifty function called source. Um, here's a link to the manual for Beanshell, so you can read all about it. But essentially, the tactic here is to source a file that has Beanshell stuff directly in it in an init script, or I'm sorry, not, not, not init script. That should say start script. And then source it again from an event script, which lets you create your own. Please reload all of my Beanshell stuff for script D event. I'll show you that. So here is a more useful script deconfiguration. We've still got that engine. Now we get a start script as well. Line 7, we pull in start.bsh from optopenmsc etsy script D. And then we also source this on line 8, event master.bsh, which is the master bean shell script file from which we'll include all the other bean shell script files if we have any. That's the end of our start script. Stop script, all it does is pull in anything from the stop.bsh. You don't necessarily have to do anything, but if you've initialized any objects in your init, you should probably clean those up unless they just know how to die gracefully when the JVM shuts down. Um, here is our event script, one of two. This is the one, if you see here on line 19, I've got a custom UEI for reload event scripts. I even put OUCE 2013 in there. That's how you know that I was actually planning ahead to making this presentation. Um, the only job of lines 18 through 23 is to implement a way to do a hot reload of all of your bean shell configuration for script D. Lines 25 through 30, those pull in, or actually, sorry, that, that provides an actual functional event script for the cheesy example action that I'm about to show you. This method, or function, I should say, on line 28, handle node loss service, will be fired only, as you see, for this particular UEI, which is the standard node loss service event. Had a customer open a ticket just a few weeks ago. He said, I'd like OpenNMS to play a sound anytime a node goes down. He actually has speakers hooked up to the OpenNMS server, mounted on the, on the ceiling in the monitoring center. And he wanted it to make noise when he had a node go down. So I said, OK, here's how I recommend doing it. He was going to do it with node FD. I said, let's try this instead and see how it goes. So here's our start.bsh. All it does is look up the bean called log. If you guys know any about bean shell at all, you can look up beans that have been not declared into the context. Uh, anyway, there, you can look up a bean by name in a bean shell script. 
This just looks up the bean called log, which we can use to do logging. You don't even need to do that. It's just handy. Stop.bsh, all it does is logs a message that says executing a stop script. Sorry, there, I've got these little space markers. These should be actual spaces. Problems with the LaTeX template. Didn't have time to work it out. OK, so questions about what these two do? It's really straightforward, right? This one, start up. This one, shut down. And here comes the event master.bsh. This is the one that gets sourced. Every time you send that reload or resource script D event files event, and it also gets sourced once at startup, so you don't have to send that event separately. This is it. Okay, do I need to narrate this one really? We're basically just using the Java audio subsystem to pull in a WAV file and play a loud noise anytime we hear a node loss service event on the event bus. Um, tested this, it actually works. It's actually not terribly dirty. And because script D does create a new thread for each invocation of this, of this method, um, you can have two node loss service events come in this close together, and the sounds will actually overlap. So it, it mixes the two together. And if you have another sound, it'll mix it together with that if it, if it doesn't decay out first. Symphony is good. Hmm? Symphony is good. Yeah. You could do, you could do a whole symphony. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. You can do that for Taurus if he comes to work. So, any questions about what the stuff in this listing does? How does it sound? I just made up the file name. Uh, the, the file that I actually used was one that the customer provided, and it had information in it in its name about the customer, so I'll leave it out. Um, all right, so questions about the... Um, the, the approach with script D. Makes sense? Okay. Using the Bean Scripting Framework Monitor. It is, in fact, only a monitor. And because we're running out of time, we're just going to fly through this. This is polar configuration.xml stuff. This is another actual customer example. Um, one of our larger customers wanted to be able to test a SOAP endpoint. They wanted to do a post to it. You cannot do a post to a SOAP endpoint using any of the polar monitors that already exist in OpenNMS. They tried with the page sequence monitor. It doesn't work because you can't specify a content type and you cannot specify an accept header using that monitor. So I put this together for them. It's kind of ugly looking, but it actually works really well. Uh, this is how you configure the Bean Scripting Framework Monitor. Lines 2 through 12 are the parameters. Actually, 2 through 15 are the parameters for it. So you need to give the BSF monitor a file name. That's the file from which it will load the BSH, the, the Bean script file, Bean shell file, rather, that contains the script you actually want to run. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, lang class just needs to be Bean shell for Bean shell. If you use a different language, that will vary. The BSF engine is the actual fully qualified class name for the engine that runs inside of the BSF. File extensions will be BSH. I'm not sure that that's required, but I always leave it there. Run type, this is important. If you don't specify a run type for the BSF monitor, it defaults to eval, I believe, which is probably not what you want because you can't return a, um, an actual value from an eval. What you get back from it is just the result of whatever happens in line. It, for some languages, eval is maybe appropriate, but for most of the time, you want to use exec with most languages. Retry and timeout, we've all seen those parameters before. They mean the same thing here as they do in other monitors. Those are implemented in the polar, up above in the polar, not in the BSF monitor itself. SOAP scheme, that is a, uh, a parameter that is specific to the BSH, the bean shell code that I've implemented that you'll see in the next slide. Uh, SOAP port, SOAP URI, input body, output regex, input MIME type, and input char set. Those are also things that are handled by the actual bean shell code that underlies this test. And we'll see those in just a second. And as always, don't forget line 18, the monitor line. If you forget that, you restart, you think, why is it not monitored? I still do that once in a while. So here's the bean shell part. 
broke it into three bits. This looks shorter than it should be. Hope it works. Um, yeah, we're pulling in log utils on line seven here. Does everybody know about log utils? If you're not a developer, you probably don't. It's just a handy set of logging methods that are from the core of OpenNMS. Um, let's see, BSF monitor, line nine. This is a bean that is declared into the bean shell context by the BSF monitor, so it's always there, it's always available. You don't ever have to look it up first. Um, results is likewise, it's essentially a um, um, hash table into which you can put results. Um, the strategy for writing a polar monitor basically goes, when we first start up and we're initialized, we say that the status is unresponsive. So UNR is short for unresponsive. This is all in the wiki, by the way, too. Line 12, we're going to log via the BSF monitor. Some more fun debug stuff. Uh, in line 13, we are using the Apache Commons HTTP client library to construct an HTTP request. Okay, I reset to line one at the top here, so forgive me. Um, all of this is just doing the business of what this thing has been asked to do. But we can see a bit here, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we're pulling in somewhere here. Here's, we're doing results. So line 12 here is if we find that the service is down or not responding effectively, we can put N OK in the results for the status key in the results hash table. Um, if that comes back, we can also put a reason. In this case, we caught an exception that indicated unsupported encoding exception. So we can actually provide, just like the regular polar monitors that are well-written do, a reason code for the node loss service event that comes back. So got pretty good power here. Logging some more, using a string builder to build the URL. And then we're logging some more. Do, 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 do. We're logging some more. I'm looking for where we're actually pulling in those parameters. Thank you. Yep, line 10. So new string entity, input body, input mime type, and input char set. Those variables, you'll notice they magically have sprung into existence. We didn't have to look them up. That's because the BSF monitor, when it uh, when it's configures itself for a run, any parameters that it doesn't already know what to do with, it just says, ah, I guess they want me to declare that bean into the BSH context. So it does that, which means there's no need to look up the bean. It's declared rather than just injected. Okay, so here's another failure case. Received server response of something bad happened. Got a valid response code. We're debugging here. And as long as the output matches the regex that's provided in the output regex, service parameter, we put OK into the results. And we're not putting here a, um, a time, I don't think anyway. Yeah, yeah, I didn't implement uh, time, but you can do time as well. You can just calculate the delta from when you started doing the actual operation that you're testing to the end. And you can put that into, uh, there's a, I think there's a separate hash table that you can put that into. It's documented in the wiki as well. So this is almost straight out of the wiki article on the BSF monitor. I made a few tweaks to make it a little bit more Beamer friendly. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. So this works. Line 25 says we fell off the bottom, which actually should never happen in this case. If you ever see that, then you know something went wrong. And that's actually all I've got in this deck. So I thank you, and I open the floor to questions if there's any time left for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned time. Uh, time is for like um, uh, response time. Response time. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, precisely. Because timeout is actually handled at the at the higher level. I'm sorry. Yes. The timeout is managed by the the SF model. Yes. Uh, well, the timeout itself is <laughs> that's bizarre. Ulf's getting sucked into a vortex. Yeah. Yeah. The timeout is actually handled by the polar itself. So if, uh, if, the, if the monitor does not return and the timeout expires, then the polar says, ah, give me that thread back, and it just stops. OK, other questions? Gary? Okay, 
question of the day. Go for it. Why, why is it after this much time there are Perl um, Because there's not a good Java implementation of Perl. Hmm? No, the question, I'm sorry, was the question was why after all this time is there not a good uh, Java way to write polar monitors? Because there is good implementation of that. Why would you want to integrate all the languages into Java? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, what, what, Peter? There could be a Perl 6 implementation. Uh, Perl 6 could conceivably run on the JVM. Um, in, instead of on Parrot. So that could happen, but Perl 6 is not Perl 5, which means Perl 6 is not what you think of as Perl. Uh, there was a JPerl project, but I'm pretty sure it's long, long been dead, and it never really worked very well. I think, I don't know if it was license issues or just lack of traction. Okay, others? No? I don't have shirts to throw at you guys, sorry. Okay, well thank you, I appreciate your time and patience.